Welcome to the final Homeville Presents presentation of the uh, winter spring season. Uh, we've had a good run thanks to all of you who have come out, whether it be in the middle of a snowstorm or uh, a day like this where uh, <clears throat> it's a lot nicer outside and it's hard to even be inside. <clears throat> I'm Chip Jeremy, I'm president of the Homeville Museum here and before we get started, just a few events we have going on over the next few months at the museum. As of May 1st, we'll have a new round of displays in all three museums. Um, in the meantime, we invite you to look around at our current ones after we get done with the presentation. Uh, some of them will be going away in the next couple of weeks. Uh, keep an eye on uh, our various ways of getting the word out, whether it be local news sources, Facebook, our website, or even just the cute little sign out front to see what kind of events we have over the summer. Uh, we have Brockway Show Weekend and uh, other events going on here during the summer. Speaking of summertime, uh, from Memorial Day to Labor Day weekend this year, uh, for the first time we'll be open on Sundays from 1 to 5. So. If you have people that can't normally make it during the normal times, Memorial Day weekend to Labor Day weekend, Sundays 1 to 5, we're trying that this year. So bring people out and uh, have fun. The final thing I would say is we've done very well, but if you ever have any suggestions for speakers, do you know of anybody who you think would be good or even just a topic uh, that you think might be interesting? Uh, let one of us here at the museum know and we'd be glad to you know consider it and uh, even if it's just an idea sometime if you mention an idea we can figure out who does presentations on it. Our speaker today is Greg Smiley. He is one of America's last typewriter designers if not possibly the last. He worked as a staff industrial designer at Smith Corona's Cortland, New York facility in the 1990s where he designed products ranging from typewriters to PCs. Yes, for those of you who didn't know, Smith Corona did do a few PCs. Uh, he is currently head of design for the Raymond Corporation, which is a lift truck manufacturer in the Toyota Materials Handling Group. Prior to Raymond, he worked in various freelance corporate and consulting roles ranging from marketing brand management to user interface specification and exhibit design. Besides over 20 material handling patents, he holds two glide key patents for text input on mobile phones and uh, PDAs. His interests include photography, music composition, and various vehicle projects, including aircraft, auto, and watercraft design, including a patent for quick fold kayaks. Born and raised in New York's Hudson Valley, he's a 1987 industrial design graduate of the University of Bridgeport, Connecticut, and completed additional coursework in human factors at the University of Michigan. He's also current. Chair, currently the chair of the Central New York chapter of the Industrial Designers Society of America. At the museum here, we know him as the guy who came in one late afternoon and started getting really interested about our Smith Corona display. He started telling war stories. We got really interested, and we, we said to him, you know, you could give a presentation. And he went, nah, why would anyone want to hear this? And we said a lot of people would. So you never know when you're going to get a speaker randomly coming in at 3 o'clock on a sleepy afternoon. But in the case of Greg, we're glad. So Greg, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, when my, my dad and I were looking for a place to go to a museum and we stopped in here by chance one day. And I really... I really didn't think 1990s was history, but <laughs> when I started telling the stories and some of the, you wouldn't believe this happened or those happened, things I, I realized, yeah, I did have something that I could contribute, and there is a wealth of uh, knowledge and experience here in the uh, central New York and the, specifically the Cortland area. What I'd like to encourage you is that out here, I'm sure there's so much more that we could collect, and I'd like to start this discussion of how do we capture the oral history, how do we write it down or record it so that future generations can learn about what we did, whether it was every day, 
work at a job or the accomplishes, accomplishments that we've, we've had. Then for this presentation, when I started pulling it together, you know, I was in my 30s working here it's, and trying to put food on the table, and you don't realize always that there's this backstory or the history. And the way that this event was advertised, it didn't always talk about that I was doing specifically my recollections in the 90s. And I thought, well, in case somebody's expecting something more, I should go and find out more. And I'm going to need your help on the probably the you know, 70s, 80s area. I've got some gaps and I have some things out of order. So please, after the presentation, let's uh, fill in the history and correct certain things. I am interested. How many people have an affiliation with Smith Corona or work there? So well over half a year of... Uh, have been have ties to Smith Corona and and the area. So I will be going in and talking about the backstory and the history. And it's just been a re an interesting journey of discovery as I've been learning more in the last last months. Where it all starts out for me again, my personal um, memories are this typewriter over here to the right. That's where I filled out my college applications. Those were formal documents. You didn't want to show correction on them. You, if you did something wrong, you wanted to do it, do it again. And it really talks to the, um, what I'd like to think of the legacy of the millions of typewriters out there that people did do business correspondence, formal correspondence, college applications, memos, etc. And little did I know when I was filling out these applications for scholarships, etc., that uh, my future boss was the designer of the... Uh, of that typewriter. So he was a graduate and his boss was also a graduate of Syracuse University where they taught minimalism as the aesthetic and that you do the bare minimum to get the essence and make it timeless. And I think some of the things that we we're doing during that era, you will see, I'll be making a lot of um, tongue-in-cheek references to a, a successful company that also embraces that same idea today, Apple Computer, one of the most successful these days. They obviously, with uh, Johnny Ives, believe in minimalism as, as a timeless aesthetic. And you'll see, I'll have some comparisons there. A much younger and thinner version of me, but again, this is out of the 1991 uh, annual report, where I was a staff designer and I was hired um, there were two other designers at the time. They had gone on to Thompson when they had moved from um, out to Indiana, and they had some openings. I, at the time, was working freelance um, down in the Connecticut area after school and doing odd jobs from exhibit design to China to lawnmowers. I was working alongside a gentleman who designed Studebakers, um, Bob Burke, and the stories he would tell are just amazing of clay on the kitchen table in the middle of the nights. But one day I had a call from Cheetah Design. I called up and I was trying to get freelance work in New Canaan, Connecticut. And as many of you may know, that's where the headquarters was at the time for Smith Corona. And they said, well, we don't have anything here, but there's a full-time position up in Cortland, New York. And at the time it was like, we can get out of Connecticut. We can live. I mean, I remember what a, you'd buy a Big Mac down in Fairfield then you'd come up here and it was half the price. And, and people talked to you at Tops. You know, you weren't, you could actually look at people and have conversations. <laughs> it was very different than, than Connecticut. Um, but I got that application together and I came up for a cold, um, I think it was beginning of January, I came up for the interview. And I realized that through all my work, I had no typewriter or consumer electronics. And I took that trusty typewriter and I said, what could I do? What's an innovation, something that could be done? And I thought, well, you know what? Put a display on it and put, you know, um, put the typewriter in the vertical orientation and put a flat panel display. That was something that was new at the time. And maybe put the keyboard separate so I could pick my distance away from it. And that's what I went into the interview with, this idea of a, uh, um, of a different way of doing something. And the funny thing is that the tongue in cheek thing here is that that's kind of the idea of the iMac when they put the CPU behind the flat screen TV. And I was, that was 13 years ahead of it that uh, had that idea. But a common theme you'll hear that I'll be, keep repeating today is 
one, either that's not who we are, that's not what we do. We're, we're the leadership for this reason. And another one is just innovation and embracing innovation and when, when it becomes something that for some reason there's a stall in the innovation. But uh, I was happy-go-lucky at a window office and at the time I'd look across from plant six where the industrial design center was and there was a big polo field there. So it was great to work late, sunny afternoon and you'd see the people trouncing around with their horses. But that was, that was my office, first uh, windows to the right, now the Murray Center, if you look to the right when you go in through the main entrance. So now the time, uh, now let's get back to the history of the, the company. This idea of innovation, times changing, and disruptive innovation isn't just an electronics recent history item. When you look back 150 years ago, what happened this week you know, the Civil War was ending. There's all these gun manufacturers that did precision metal parts, fine, fine um, devices. And what are they going to do after the war? The gentleman, an engineer, goes down to the, the Centennial Show down in Philadelphia, sees typewriters. And some people have patents on things and comes back with this idea to Syracuse. Hey, you, rather than making guns, you could make these typewriters. And that's where things got started for the uh, Smith brothers, four of them. And um, admittedly, this, a lot of this is stuff that I'm filling in the blanks. I knew some of it, but I'm just learning more and more. The other disruptive innovation for me, which was interesting to find out, is that the reason they came to Groton was because another technology was being displaced. There was a huge factory available because this funny thing called the automobile was replacing carriages. And this big carriage manufacturer didn't have anything to, uh, their market was going down. And they came in to that, to that factory and that became the, the Groton facility. So here we have here, and it was clearly, and you know, you'll have, you'll know these stories of, you know, typewriter club annual annual outing and uh, right in the center of town and you had the the different uh, there's the inn right to the left this is the corner of spring street and maine in groton now surprisingly another reason was that independent of smith corona there was already typewriter experience in the groton area and that was the crandall so the crandall typewriter is another reason why why things migrated from somebody in syracuse and new york city thinking let's find a place to manufacture. And of course we have the sample here. The Corona is what the, the Rose Company, eventually the Corona, that changed the name based on a successful model, was really built on portability and the small manual typewriter. That's, that was the niche that uh, Smith Corona, or at the time Royal, um, not Royal, the, uh, the Rose Company, which became Corona and then the Standard, uh, was known for. Here's a common theme you'll see when I get these pictures of the various facilities in Groton and uh, in Syracuse. Obviously, the, in the Times, they didn't always smile for the photos, so I, I think it's funny to look at this and see, see those. You know, there's one person smiling in the corner there. But you can see the, uh, what assembly was like in the, uh, those days in the various uh, work environment. Who knew there was a band? <laughs> Smith Corona had a band. And how many people knew there was a baseball team? <laughs> and the Corona float? Really the social hub and, the, and you know, much more than what we think sometimes today's companies have. I had to throw in a picture of a, a more recent people that I knew from the news clipping just to compare the smiles versus the stern looks. Come on, smile. <laughs> and again, not only the portability of smaller typewriters, but the folding typewriter was a key successful aspect for the stand at this time, the standard typewriter company. And you can see that the top carriage area flipped over and made a rectangular um, 
for storage and easy transport. And that became a, a recurring theme when you think of Smith Corona in later years, even through the electric portables. And you know, even through the war effort working on decoders and from toy typewriters, the whole growing through Marchant, Smith Corona Marchant, and the acquisitions in, in Europe. Uh, it's a rather dynamic and interesting time, both Cortland End and uh, Groton, and then the Syracuse plant was closed first and then migrated down eventually just to, just to Cortland. I have a question we were talking about earlier today is I don't know how, you know, Smith Corona made guns for the war effort and I heard the story that they were making the decoders and one of the reasons they attribute the success of Smith Corona is they got done with their contract early and they were able to get back into the business of selling typewriters before other companies were and that was a a jump start for them. But I just really don't know how these different aspects were doled out. I'm certainly aware of the guns and the, the different uh, mechanisms and components that they were making during the war effort. And throughout the years, these are, you know, the first electric portable was made in, in Groton and both Cortland and the Groton facilities, all different. The one on the lower left, that's what I first remember as a child, my parents' typewriter. That was the, the model that I first started banging on, uh, on, on keys. And here the you know, selling of the farm in Cortlandville for the Cortland facility, that was where it was all gonna be consolidated. That's my father up there. That's your father in the photo, that's yeah, great. He was the real Fantastic. And they have right there the, uh, the groundbreaking. Now, with the consolidation for a, a town that is the company, is the town, you can imagine how the culture, how that rocked the area. And look at that, uh, look at that downtown area. And today, the corner of Spring and, and Main is a mobile station. And it's just a surprising contrast of how that's, that was raised. You still have the, uh, the Corona Club. It was the Smith Corona Club where they'd go for bowling and today still stands and it's known as the Corona Club. Pretty much plant one is, looks very much like it did today, just add the, uh, the color change out front for Paul. And uh, that's how I knew it was the big Smith Corona plant one, where we were over, Design Center was in six, and then we eventually moved over to one before then going over to Benny Road. And if you look at from the shot I took today, that was very much like it was the time I was there. It just previously had the SCM logo on it, and there's a picture from 59 when that was being constructed. So now back to my experience of my recollections. And so I, I came up, got hired as a staff designer. First project I worked on was the laptop word processor, a redesign of that. Three and a half floppy disks were the memory storage. And we had multiple versions and multiple colors. And you had to be up on what was hip and what was new for next year's, you know, they never moved Christmas. So you always had to have your models out in time for those. And I was asked to redesign a CRT word processor that they said, look to, look to military. Look, and we don't care, this one's so heavy, we don't think it needs to be portable anymore. And that was my first major project where they really invested and said, let's, you know, what makes something look contemporary and, and minimalism? So that's what was called the PWPB. And that was my design, which you see here. This is the daisy wheel version. In the photo, this is the thermal printer version that had fonts. And at the time, what you see is what you get was something new. To be able to see a font in the size on the screen was a new idea. And uh, we, we really struggled with the software was the toughest piece on this product. We got the, the enclosure, all the technical details, getting the keyboard and all the things to fit on this, but it was really a challenge to uh, get the keyboard to deliver, the software to deliver everything that we wanted to at the time. I remember the uh, first time I did the drawing, we used to draw on vellum with mechanical pencils. That's how we communicated the designs would bring it over to Rudy Fadrizi in the model shop. And he was the company, you know, he'd say, he'd either say, oh, it's the beautiful thing, or, oh, it's a pig. 
that was his, you know, his initial, and he knew. So when he made this, he really liked it, and uh, and th this is a photo of that model that he made. He came down from GE and was a fantastic model maker. So this is a plastic model. Um, it actually, in this time frame, computers were early in machining, so they actually, for this back corner of the unit, I'll, I'll point it out later, they actually gave me a piece of plastic and said, carve it out how you want it to look. And so actually this typewriter has a little corner that's my hand sculpting because that's the only way they could convey that pattern over to a, uh, over to a tool. And it was fairly new to be thinking of something that side actions and pulls took a huge press. And we had to go to Dayton, Ohio to a very large ton press manufacturer. I remember going out with Don Reisinger and uh, Jim DiPolito and we'd get in the rental car and he'd treat the gas pedal like it was a toggle. It was either on or off and we'd zip off to the, the tool makers and we'd walk around the place to see how they're going to make our tool. And we had ours set up for the very first shot. And it's so amazing that when you think of something for months in your mind and you know every aspect in every corner and then when they make the very first physical one off the tool and they inject it in and it's like toothpaste and the machine goes boom and they take out this part and they open it up and they hand you the first part and they're usually lousy looking that it's not they're typically short shots they want to shoot it minimal rather than over pressurize the mold and I still have that first shot and it was just amazing in some odd gray color but it's just the invigoration of wow this is the first of millions that they're going to make and I'm, I'm seeing the very first one off the press. Um, at the time, little did I know, I walked next to us, there was another company making a squared off unit, which I thought was rather peculiar for two reasons. One was that there were so many changes. Obviously the designers and the engineers didn't have their act together, they were just making all these changes and they were inserting the tool over and over. And then also I thought it was strange, they moved the keyboard up to the front of the pivot and they had this little tr ball thing, a little hole toward the front. Now I know that that was the original power book that Apple was doing. So we were making our PWPB while App Apple was making the power book, which was also a very rectilinear squared off item. The other thing about this one, as I joke, again, it's, it's not fair and I just, it's a joking comparison, but if you, it was new for us. It was a big push to get a wraparound screen that looked clean and was dark rather than a white background. <laughs> and it had just a thin band along the bottom, which when I saw the iMac aluminum version come out 15 years later, <laughs> I was saying, okay, somebody thinks along the same lines. But again, I just am adding these little Apple tie-ins just for the novelty of it. So again, like I said, what you see is what you get on our thermal versions. And immediately after you do that, you have to think of variations. How are we going to vary it two years down the road? How do we get a different look but only change one part? And that was a big part of what I would do one design, then I had to work on additional designs. And we also did something called private branding. Private branding was a way that you could support other companies like Montgomery Ward, Sears, etc. And they could sell at a different price point with a different feature set. So you could make them different but people weren't just going in for price. If there was just one model at every place, they would expect the price to be that one same price. So private branding became a big part of, I had to have a different color for a different customer and had to figure out, make it look totally different without changing much. And I get that all the time. That's been a big part of my career. Sterling is another one. You'll see the first Sterling up here from the Corona but that was another brand that we had that we continued and would sell through different channels. And mixed media, it's interesting. Today, when they look back to designer sketches and things like that, the era of the 80s to 90s is one of the hardest archival um, museum storage because we used benzene markers. This sketch is Prismacolor spray paint, um, gouache, and color paper, spray glue. So this one rendering, for us to get that effect, 
before the age of digital renditions was a lot of techniques of how to get the look that you're after. Um, but that was one of the Sterlings. This is actually the NL typewriter, the last typewriter to be designed in Cortland for Smith Corona. The NL was a lowest cost typewriter that we made. It was also, when you think of this, you had to shave off you know, the smallest amount in a detail to save a quarter of a penny because that was so important over large volumes. I remember quoting this program that it was not considered viable. We didn't consider a, a, a program viable unless you had 1.4 million units. And you just, when you look back on that, how did we make that many? You know, but it's just, that was the NL typewriter. The other thing I had to do was be involved in the trends and color studies. So I spent a lot of time painting and mixing up custom colors, and we named them all silly names like champagne and charcoal and silver ash. And, but you also had to do, I did 100 green for one customer. These were some youth-oriented ones that I was working on, changing the fonts, just trying to get a different, different look. So I participated in a color marketing group, would go down to different conferences once a year, where you had to prove that you went out and researched somewhere and found out what the next in color is, where everybody says they plan that next color. It really is, in fact, a bit of people saying, well, we think it's going this way, but it's a, mostly finding out what are the real trends, the economic shifts, and that you don't want to come out with an avocado typewriter when all the, the countertops are forest green, for example. But I was, I was part of color marketing group and I had to know those things and I also had to know things like metamerism. That when I picked that one color, sometimes that color on a gray background would look terrible or printed in this ink under that light would look completely different color. And it was the perceived quality that you'd be involved with. So sometimes simple thing like a little purple line was a big deal in a manufacturing environment and controlling all of those things. Part of our private branding, we also did Philips and Singer, and we sent products around the globe. The other thing is our documentation department, we had a designer that spent, Frank Rashadi spent his entire time doing keyboard variations for documentation. We had like 88 countries that we would make Cyrillic, Russian, Hungarian. They place character names and they have different <laughs> characters in all of these different locations. And when you come out with one typewriter, you need to do all those versions and document it and know that the right one got printed on the right, right thing. And the accuracy of, of uh, overlays, the little display area. I remember coming in from the exhibit business. I had just done a 40-foot um, long exhibit for Sikorsky, and it was within a quarter inch. We were like, yeah. Came up here, and you know, Al McDonald calls me up, and he goes, so I've got something that's 11 thousandths off, and you need to redo that, that artwork, which meant we would have to hand ink artwork, put it in the iTech machine, run off films, go back over, make sure the documentation number is right, and go through documentation. So there's a lot of handwork before the age of computers today, run off a digital file and send it to the vendor or, or printer. It's very different. Funny, during the... Uh, my first year there, I was also thinking about, well, we've got to, you know, we knew that the typewriter was a declining market. We used to refer to Buggy Whip that things are declining and, and things are going down. But there was also this company line of, well, you always need envelopes, carbons, and forms. We're always going to have that. It's never going to go away. Typewriters will always be here. And, but I was thinking, you know, there's certain things coming and, and this or that and just could not get the interest going to go in different directions. I worked after hours and I was trying to think, as devices were getting handheld and smaller and thinking about that, I worked after hours trying to work on mechanisms and how could you type, how could you touch type while you're holding a device? And I actually presented the idea, showed it to management, went down to New Canaan and showed it and they basically said, eh, we're not interested, but you know, that key might be a little text input on our word processor. So go ahead, patent it. So I actually got a couple of patents on two different versions of what is called the Glide key. And that was the early predecessor of, for Nokia and other companies of how they 
um, how you do digital input today. And a lot of companies use this patent, but unfortunately, through the bankruptcy, maintenance fees weren't paid and it became public domain. So this patent is no longer enforceable, but it's still, still registered. Um, but it's interesting to look back, you know, get, again, my, uh, my uh, well, there's, there's a little bit of, <laughs> a little bit of pain when you say this, but, um, you know, what it could have been. A common feature that's um, in all cell phones today is, um, you know, the idea of the virtual keyboard and the idea that a key goes larger when you're underneath your finger or when you're highlighting a specific character. And that was one of the features of what I had in the, in the uh, different uh, devices that we made. And it's interesting, well, again, this is very minimalist um, approach and that was, um, that was the aesthetic and it's interesting now, again, that's kind of back in today. And even the name WordPad, you know, we think of the iPad, the, the term, you know, here was 13 or more years before, um, had many of these things that are common today and actually used. Uh, just, it was tough to get management interested and to innovate to go to the next level. Even one where um, I had thought of, you know, how do we make it better or easier for, for people to use and what is our market primarily? And the idea, I got the idea of, well, why don't we magnify it? Well, people had magnifying lenses and it just drove your, your eye nuts as you moved a magnifying glass as you're looking at that area. And it was kind of dark in there. Um, so actually, when you think of the Binghamton area and the whole simulation market that evolved from the, the um, organ, grind, organ company that then became the simulation, Link Simulation, and all those companies that were into simulation after that, there was a lot of optics knowledge down in the Binghamton area. Went down to see a um, optics expert and I said, I want to do a bar lens where I'm only magnifying the height, not the width. I want to make characters look like they're condensed. And that's where we came up with the MagnaView. Uh, did some patent filings on this uh, as well. But the, surprisingly, it did bring light into the area of the carriage. It made the text look higher and you didn't have to go side to side. For production, we had it all the way to you know, snapping on the NL and you can see it's magnifying the lens there. But again, weren't really interested in it and didn't go, didn't go further. So then the big, big shocker to us in the news was suddenly one day we're cranking out all these devices in the, uh, in the Cortland factory and then they announced that, you know, Bill Henderson walks up, calls everybody to the, to the cafeteria. We're like, why are we all called in here? We're standing. Then immediately he's talking in the past tense. Like, what is going on? There's guards standing around him. We're like, what is happening? And it was just something to, that you live through and you, know, you look back on, but um, then they say, oh, we're moving to uh, Tijuana for operations. And we just said, this is, this is when companies are finding quality problems and they're coming out of Tijuana. Why, why are we going in when other people are coming out? So just the, obviously, the shock to the community, the organization, and the you know, the, the people impacted by that. During that, in IDC, we were the young guys. My boss was like, we can turn this around. We can do new things. We can get them interested. Let's get things going. And we kept working on things. What a strange idea, a large touchscreen display with stylus pen input. You know, that's also a telephone or might even have a printer on it. Uh, not interested. Um, kitchen PCs, let's take the CRT, put it under the counter, put in this different keyboard, or even the idea of projection technology. Now you have to think, this is 94. Look at what was being presented to management in 94 and just didn't spark. You know, in hindsight, asking when I called these executives and say, why, what happened? And they're just, we had already felt it was too late. You know, that it was just, we're, we're seniors in management and it's just, it's too late. Um, but at the time, for us, we were trying to reinvigorate the company and get them going. How about the idea of make the thing as slim as possible, make it a fashion item and as high quality as possible? And it's just interesting, again, I go back to Mac. Look at that middle unit. My, my boss did something called the electronic briefcase. We did focus groups on it. 
And it was the idea of a slim, fashionable keyboard, flat screen TV. But they all said, why would I want something without the printer in it? And we were like, no, just have that little thing that you do creation, then connect it to the printer. Not interested. Even the idea of why don't we extend electronics into something like sport, fashion, that you're exercising and you could have sensors, you could have warnings and you could have alarms and you could do all these things with electronics. We can do software, we can do electronics, we could expand into that area. Again, not interested, but 14 years before the Fitbits. <laughs> so it's just, we're just, you know, going nuts when I see these things, you know. Proposed, presented, could have been, and, and how do you go beyond that and say, okay, that's, that's what it was, and it just wasn't meant to be. Um, but it just goes on and on. Here, here's another one. The, this is the real kicker for me. Smith Corona was courted by Motorola. Motorola came to Smith Corona. At the time, Motorola, years back in the mid-90s, mid did not have a mass market presence. Smith Corona had brand recognition and distribution. Motorola, which went on to be acquired by Google, Android, etc., cetera, um, had all this commercial wireless technology and digital display, organizer, computing power, and they wanted to put the Smith Corona name on it and then continue wireless. And what came out of the meeting was, we don't think this wireless thing is going to happen. <laughs> so, so now, that's 13 years before. And now, just in hindsight, look at the, look at the aspect ratio on that uh, person holding the, holding the iPhone and look at that sketch that I did where I'm holding a wireless device that uh, does, you know, does pretty much similar, or at least could evolve into that technology. And that was Motorola approaching Smith Corona. So operations move out of plant one. IDC moves over to, um, I think that was a printing area one time, I don't know, but that was the, the right side as you're looking at the front of the building. And we're continuing on. And, but one thing they did want to do was, it wasn't wireless, here's an idea called a Handyfax. Who's heard of a Handyfax? This was a device where you would type in a little message and then pop up these two little acoustic couplers and you could go up to a phone booth like Superman and touch it to that um, phone and by acoustic coupling, you could then send your text message to a fax machine somewhere else. So um, we, that one we did put on the market and I don't know how many sold, but uh, needless to say, I designed the Handyfax 2 and that didn't, didn't go further. We talked to X10, an idea of home security, home connection, connectivity. And we said we could brand it so that all of these different elements could be in a very simplistic, where you'd buy this whole system of the connected home and home security. Again, I think there's this aversion to wireless, but no interest in pursuing the, uh, the home office security systems. As many of you know, like we said earlier, that we did get in the PC market, and our entry was partnering with Acer Computer, who went on to um, buy Gateway and is a tablet manufacturer and, and uh, laptop manufacturer today. Um, we were all shocked when two years later, after we were finally in PCs, we were designing them, and it was the first 386 multimedia in North America, or in the world, you know, we had some firsts, um, Basically, they said there's a lot of competition, and we got out of the market because it was a highly competitive arena, but not the investment of, of where we're going. I remember I had my, uh, my Smith Corona stock, and I think we were issued 200 shares or whatever, and when it, when it went below 1 20th of a cent, I knew it was time to stop, stop following it. So it was the, at that time, we were like, you know, G. Lee Thompson was the head, and we're like, what's going on? Why, why, why? Um, and of course, then the shocker of 95 was when I was part of the class of 95 was the delusion of the engineering and design departments that essentially um, that set of layoffs, I left the company. And uh, 
went on to local area, worked up in um, Skinny Atlas for a number of consulting firms. And a um, couple of years later, I got a phone call. John Wolf said, hey, you want to come back? We're a new company. This is the new Smith Corona. We're, we're now a home office, small office. And we're not going to be, we're a sales and marketing organization. We're not going to manufacture them. We're going to make work with partners that are high quality that we put our brand name on. And there's this new, new presence. And so I was hired on and I primarily worked for user interface for the cordless telephones. Uh, That was a big part of my initial work. But then I went back to a lot of the industrial design, plastics design and closures I did before. Different totally different job for me. It involved international travel and I was going over to Asia, sitting by a tool. I remember sitting down at the time with a professor in Hong Kong who came up with this novel idea that you didn't have to train voice recognition. You could just say a word and it'll recognize the number. So voice dialing was in its infancy and I was working with the doctor that was uh, developing the algorithm. Also, we said, we've got to get top designers. So we started working with firms out of LA. And I remember lunches at LA were the strangest thing. To fly from here, it was hot in LA, and lunch hours, we were watching everybody's plastic surgery and different hairdos. That was, that was the activity for what they would do out there. But that's how we got these designs for the various phones. You'll see, you'll see this uh, version here. Sample that I brought in with TCOM, that was the partner in, uh, in Taiwan that we worked with but all different kinds of products. But then there was this challenge of the focus of who were we? We were trying to get anybody that had a product that one, we could slap our name on, but how do we know that the quality is there and how do we get them to certify? We worked with IBM and the, the speak voice recognition, all these different companies. We even worked with a, a printer company that made um, dye sublimation printers that you could do these prints like Polaroid. The only problem is that when they sat in storage, all the little bubbles would burst as you're shipping them across the country and you'd get this brightly colored printout. So it's like, no, that one didn't pass, that didn't pass. So it was, it was again an interesting time. This was down when we were then we were down around 100 employees and I was asked to do the layout. They said, Greg, there's a, you know, over in Benny Road, what used to be our parts division was sold to AT&T. AT&T went in and they had a call center. Two years later, they pulled out and they literally pulled out the infrastructure of the wires and they cut them all at half the lengths. So then I had to figure out, go up in the ceiling, have somebody measure the length of every wire and then reconnect a wire drop for 30 office cubicles. What a puzzle. But I got to take my design expertise of where should the printer be, who's going to be next to what office, and this or that. So is it, I've since then done two other corporate moves and layouts because of, you know, it's interesting the experiences you go through, how you don't realize at the time how it helps you in what you've, the life lessons that you've learned. One of the things I think back before we left Plant One was when I was working for John Wolf, we had a winter that was so heavy that the snow came all the way up, the drift filled all the way up to the roof line. The funny thing for me is that the mice found the warmth was on the glass. And it looked like, you know, those classic ant farms? (laughs) So you'd sit in your office with the VP and a mouse is going up and down and around. So that's, that's a very memorable, unique experience for me. So, again, the call center was refashioned for 100 people left with uh, Smith Corona Corporation over on Benny Road. And uh, John Birmingham was the, the new CEO. We were all kind of suspicious that he never he got an apartment, he never bought a house. The Vince Abitello never bought a house. And we're like, uh-oh, and he had just closed Royal. Um, so we kind of, we kind of knew. And then, then it got to be three people per week got laid off. And let me tell you what an interesting culture of, you know, trust and backstabbing or whatever when you know it's almost like survivor who are the next three that are going to get um so that was quite an interesting time but it was a growth area like any opportunity um all of a sudden i was asked to be a project manager then i was asked to be a brand manager i was managing the inkjet line i was managing the headsets 
Here's another one. I was suggesting, why do all headsets have to be black plastic? And I was suggesting, why not, it's like jewelry and you put it around your head, why not have it bronze and different aesthetics and make it more like jewelry that people want to wear it and it's small. And again, it's not a fair comparison, but 16 years later, look at where Apple is with their, the idea of the Apple Watch. But at the time, it was just tough to get people to buy in. The other thing I learned is very fast development when you're sourcing. I got called into an office, Greg, you have a project. And Wanda knows this too. 11 weeks, I want this product on the shelf in the UK. We're doing a laminator. So that laminator there, from idea to 11 weeks later, it was on the shelf in volume overseas. And that's where I learned the idea of there's the morning stand-up meeting, and there's a 3 o'clock afternoon what happened, and there's a way to get things done. Um, that I never would have under different, different circumstances. But still, it was the, the product lines and the quality of certain things. It was a, a mishmash. We had existing product. We were entertaining new product and some things that just didn't pass, didn't pass muster. Very interesting time. And a lot of this, uh, for the products, I wasn't, sometimes I was designing the full product, but a lot of times it was the graphics and it was the, uh, um, an existing, existing product. So here we've had new graphics and colors. Kind of ironic that the last typewriter from Cortland was called the Office 2000. And that's, uh, you know, in 2000, that's when it was last, last made. But uh, that is the, that's the NL. And then a strange thing happened. We started just putting our name on other companies' typewriters. And the quality wasn't there. And it was coming from different places. And we really struggled with that. And ultimately, you know, talking to the current um, CEO of, in Cleveland, you know, things started, you know, Smith Crone was known for a certain quality level and things just weren't working and stuff was, was falling apart. But this was for European requirements of having a low keyboard, that was one. And then ultimately the last product that Smith Crone as a corporation was selling up until a few years ago um, was the WordSmith 200. I did the graphics for this and the colors and the specification, but again, not making parts and not designing the shape and appearance with it. This was from uh, South Korea. Um, ultimately, you know, it came down to, we just ran out of money that had these new products, this or that, no real focus and, and what was Smith Corona. And uh, the home office could have worked. It just struggled to... Uh, to make that work. And here's what um, one real interesting point. When it came down to two potential buyers, one was going to stay in Cortland for the 100 employees and continue and look at the, the electronics products. The other one was a thermal ribbon maker in Cleveland, Ohio. 90% of the profit for the company at the time was coming from two things having, hanging on the shelf, two SKUs. There's such an installed base of typewriters through the US of the H series cassette, the 80s through the 2000s, that essentially the ribbon and the correction ribbon made most of the profit for the company. And a couple weeks ago, I went down to Mullins and I bought their very last H series ribbon cassette just to, to honor that. But when you think of who do you sell the company to and what's their interest, so you, you can understand why Portland operations closed and it became a three-person company in Cleveland, a division of, of Pubco. And so a new chapter started. So the chapter in Cortland closed. Smith Crone is now a corporation in Cleveland and their branding of the thermal ribbons is what continues. They just, the H-series cassette this past December, they finally stopped making that in Hong Kong. One of the knockoff companies, they're licensing Smith Cronus to still make the H-Series cassette. But essentially, the entire corporation is now fully behind branding of thermal ribbons, which is different. They have embraced the history, which is um, interesting that it's been very supportive. And I've been talking to Jonathan in, uh, in Cleveland. He's a Case Western graduate, and he's a PhD, PhD uh, um, student there. And it's just real interesting sharing the stories, collecting the stories. And he's, you know, I'm going to be sharing a lot of the images and content from this speech 
And I really want to continue, like I said, this idea of how do we capture this oral history, the a lot of hardship, but a lot of great things that we learned and knew, and just let's continue this idea of Smith Corona um, as a rich history in the central New York and Cortland areas, Groton. I definitely want to thank the support for this back information that I pulled together. A lot of help from the Groton Historical Society, Cortland Historical Society, and Jonathan out in Cleveland. So with that, certainly we can come on down. I can show you the, show you the units, and uh, let's uh, start collecting your stories as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.